This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Graham Redman. Reginald, short stories by Saki. Reginald's Rubaiyat. The other day, confided Reginald, when I was killing time in the bathroom and making bad resolutions for the new year, it occurred to me that I would like to be a poet. The chief qualification, I understand, is that you must be born. Well, I hunted up my birth certificate, and found that I was all right on that score, and then I got to work on a hymn to the new year, which struck me as having possibilities. It suggested extremely unusual things to absolutely unlikely people, which I believe is the art of first-class catering in any department. Quite the best verse in it went something like this. Have you heard the groan of a graveled grouse, or the snarl of a snaffled snail, husband or mother like me, or spouse? Have you lain a creep in the darkened house where the wounded wombats wail? It was quite improbable that any one had, you know, and that's where it stimulated the imagination and took people out of their narrow humdrum cells. No one has ever called me narrow or humdrum, but even I felt worked up now and then at the thought of that house with the stricken wombats in it. It simply wasn't nice. But the editors were unanimous in leaving it alone. They said the thing had been done before, and done worse and that the market for that sort of work was extremely limited. It was just on the top of that discouragement that the Duchess wanted me to write something in her album. Something Persian, you know, and just a little bit decadent. And I thought a quatrain on an unwholesome egg would meet the requirements of the case. So I started in with, Cackle, cackle, little hen, how I wonder if and when once you laid the egg that I met, alas, too late, amen. The Duchess objected to the amen, which I thought gave an air of forgiveness and show jugé to the whole thing. Also, she said it wasn't Persian enough, as though I were trying to sell her a kitten whose mother had married for love rather than pedigree. So I recast it entirely, and the new version read, The hen that laid thee moons ago, Who knows in what dead yesterday her shades repose? To some election turn thy waning span, And rain thy rottenness on fiscal foes. I thought there was enough suggestion of decay in that to satisfy a jackal, and to me there was something infinitely pathetic and appealing in the idea of the egg having a sort of St. Luke's summer of commercial usefulness. But the Duchess begged me to leave out any political illusions. She's the president of a women's something or other, and she said it might be taken as an endorsement of deplorable methods. I never can remember which party Irene discourages with her support, but I shan't forget an occasion when I was staying at her place, and she gave me a pamphlet to leave at the house of a doubtful voter, and some grapes and things for a woman who was suffering from a chill on the top of a patent medicine. I thought it much cleverer to give the grapes to the former, and the political literature to the sick woman, and the Duchess was quite absurdly annoyed about it afterwards. It seems the leaflet was addressed to those about to wobble, I wasn't responsible for the silly title of the thing, and the woman never recovered. Anyway, the voter was completely won over by the grapes and jellies, and I think that should have balanced matters. The Duchess called it bribery, and said it might have compromised the candidate she was supporting. He was expected to subscribe to church funds and chapel funds, and football and cricket clubs and regattas, and bazaars, and bean-feasts, and bell-ringers, and poultry-shows, and ploughing-matches, and reading-rooms, and choir-outings, and shooting-trophies, and testimonials, and anything of that sort. But bribery would not have been tolerated. I fancy I have perhaps more talent for electioneering than for poetry, and I was really getting extended over this quatrain business. The egg began to be unmanageable, and the Duchess suggested something with a French literary ring about it. I hunted back in my mind for the most familiar French classic that I could take liberties with, 
and after a little exercise of memory I turned out the following. Hast thou the pen that once the gardener had? I have it not, and no, these pears are bad. O oh, larger than the horses of the prince are those the general drives in Kaikobad. Even that didn't altogether satisfy Irene. I fancy the geography of it puzzled her. She probably thought Kaikobad was an unfashionable German spa, where you'd meet matrimonial bargain-hunters and emergency Servian kings. My temper was beginning to slip its moorings by that time. I look rather nice when I lose my temper. I hoped you would say I lose it very often. I mustn't monopolize the conversation. Of course, if you want something really Persian and passionate with red wine and bulbuls in it, I went on to suggest. But she grabbed the book from me. Not for worlds, nothing with red wine or passion in it. Dear Agatha gave me the album, and she would be mortified to the quick. I said I didn't believe Agatha had a quick, and we got quite heated in arguing the matter. Finally, the Duchess declared I shouldn't write anything nasty in her book, and I said I shouldn't write anything in her nasty book, so there wasn't a very wide point of difference between us. For the rest of the afternoon I pretended to be sulking, but I was really working back to that quatrain like a fox terrier that's buried a deferred lunch in a private flower bed. When I got an opportunity I hunted up Agatha's autograph, which had the front page all to itself, and, copying her prim handwriting as well as I could, I inserted above it the following Tibetan fragment. With thee, O oh my beloved, to do a dark, a dark, I believe, is a sort of uncomfortable post-journey, on the pack-saddle of a grunting yak, with never room for chilling chaperone, twere better than a panhard in the park. That Agatha would get on to a yak in company with a lover, even in the comparative seclusion of Tibet, is unthinkable. I very much doubt if she'd do it with her own husband in the privacy of the Saint-Plan tunnel. But poetry, as I've remarked before, should always stimulate the imagination. Uh, by the way, when you asked me the other day to dine with you on the 14th, I said I was dining with the Duchess. Well, I'm not. I'm dining with you. End of Reginald's Rubaiyat. This recording is in the public domain.